Okay, we're going to pick up with the second part of the Art 101A, uh, April's 8th Wednesday lecture on the emerging modern America. And I'm going to admit my students back into the room, the Zoom room. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. Hi, Ali. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Let me share the screen now. Right. Can you see the painting we were looking at again, uh, Ali? Yeah. Okay, thanks for coming back and joining us, everybody. Should be a few more coming back in just a moment. So, uh, who was I bothering? Uh, Callie, I think I was picking on you, right? Yes. So can you see the text across the screen here? Yes. So uh, when we see this pay, well, let me go back and for a moment. Maybe I shouldn't give away just yet. More of a, a harder. I think everyone, most everyone's back. So Callie, that mm -hmm. jacket behind him is in fact a, uh, a jacket from the Union Army, which is the winning side. The good guys won in the Civil yes. War. The Union is the North, this Confederacy with the South. By the way, H.B. Plant Hall the, at UT, the Plant Hall, the, the guy mm -hmm. who built Plant Hall, he was, uh, he was in charge of payroll for the Confederacy. I think I knew that because I've been on that tour like twice for separate classes, and I think they told us that. That is crazy. And so for me, you have to remember, people in the late 1800s, they had their foot somewhere in the war or didn't. And if you're in the South, I mean, who knows how, how dirty your hands were, how stained your hands were. But it makes, yeah. me, it makes me wonder if he ran off with all the payroll money and then built Plant Hall with all the riches and stuff. So I'm going oh, to I'm gonna yeah. look into that. I'll let you know. And then we can all go dig up the treasure. And, <laughs> Perfect. And, and, and donate a great it. activity. Yeah. So uh, back to this painting. So this is, in fact, uh, a Union soldier who has taken off his coat and put it on the ground. So how might that relate to the war, County? Maybe since the Union did win, it's sort of a sign of like, he knows that everything's fine. So it's kind of a relaxed, like he doesn't have to be exactly quite ready for something to happen, you know, as in wearing the jacket. Yeah. And what is he doing here? Um, it looks like, is that, I, okay. It looks like he's cutting down crops. Mm -hmm. that's, with that's good. That's good. It doesn't matter. I mean, yep. it's, it's, I think it's called a scythe. I'm not sure if I pronounced right. The scythe. We wouldn't it's use okay. that today. No we'd, we'd have a big mechanical farm machine that would do that. Yep. But of course, it's late 1800s, so we're not mechanized yet fully. And he's right. using this tool for cutting down the wheat. And you can see the mm -hmm. falling, the fallen wheat behind him. And so it is, like you said, a painting about normal, about being normal again, right? About yep. life going back to normal. And harvesting your crop is a declaration of 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 nourishment, a declaration of peace. Just the activity of farming indicates that we've gone back to normal. And I would say that that is a very subtle and wonderful way to look at, uh, to treat war, a painting about war, not bombs necessarily and bloodshed, but what normal looks like. And I think you guys likewise can appreciate the value of normal, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, normal is, is whatever until it's not. And then you're sort of like, oh, I wish I had normal again. And so right now we're going through a sort of crisis where normal is what everyone kind of wants. Of course, when we get it back, just count how, how quickly we, we stop appreciating it. So another painting about war, yet told in a really sort of unexpected way. And you can see here, it says in 1865, uh, after Lincoln's assassination, Homer's uh, canvas Homer's painting de depicts a farmer, a veteran, his discarded jacket, a harvest of, de of death, sort of perhaps expressing um, the Grim Reaper is the guy who takes your soul. And so it's almost a reference of, to fallen soldiers, perhaps. But I think that's not necessarily, it's not a painting that's necessarily sad. It's just a sort of visual reference to the fact that this behind him is the war. So this fallen grain is sort of the, the wounded, dead people who died but in front of him is life. So in a way, I think the painting has a little bit of a bittersweet story, um, reflecting on the United States as a sort of, as a harvest, right? 
So yeah. let's keep looking at a few more paintings. Here's another painting from the same uh, sort of, or from the late 1800s. We're kind of moving away from the Civil War now, so I can just show you normal, you know, what life looks like in a normal, we're sort of entering the modern era. Uh, uh, Paulina, I'm gonna switch to someone else. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Paulina, you there? Yes. So what's this painting showing? Uh, a woman in her house with her child. So with, and, and are they related? I guess, yeah. And what's the mom doing? Sewing. Sewing? Who's she sewing for? Maybe her daughter. And that's probably the little girl right there, right? Yeah. So it's a very simple, straightforward painting. You know, we're not supposed to get any political message here. It's, again, a painting that celebrates sort of everyday life. And it's not a religious painting. And yet there's something almost holy about it. It's, and you could think about, well, there's nothing more holy to you than probably your parents or your children, especially one day. So the artist here, I think, is treating those things that are probably most important to her. And this is in a case, this here you can see it's Mary Cassatt. And so it might be a portrait of a woman she knows, but she's sort of celebrating the, the sort of beauty or the, the simplicity of a normal moment. And you don't need paintings to be paintings of queens and kings and gods and whatever, or soldiers for us to extract real value that we can relate to. And of course, it's fun that the little girl is looking right at us. It's almost very photographic in the sense that she's acknowledging the camera, but here it's more she's acknowledging the painter. But since I bring up this, this uh, and there's probably a lot more meaning to this painting, but, but I want to go on so we can catch up to some other important things going on um, with photography. But before we do, here's another wonderful painting. Um, Paulina, what's going on in this picture? A girl is serving like tea or something and the other is just like sitting there waiting for it. So there's two young women, girl, probably young women that make having a tea party, right? Yeah. And do they know each other? Probably. How do you know? Because they're in the same room. Okay, that's good. That's, there are people who are in the same room in a sort of setting like this. It's not a public space. It's a private space. So that's one indication they might know each other. Um, what else indicates they might know each other, Paulina? They're dressed similar. The dress, is that uh, Mark? No, that's AJ. AJ, so what about, so why being dressed similar necessarily, what about that makes them possibly related or know each other? Uh, they're, they're probably in the same social class, okay. that they probably attend the same shows and, and whatever. Good. Good. Same, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they might even be sisters, right? For, for all we right. know. Um, AJ, since you're talking, what else, what else do you see here going on? Just what other details are things that stand out to you? I don't know if she's serving the other. I'm assuming that they're, they're, they're having tea together. Mm -hmm. I don't think that she would be serving the other mm -hmm. woman. Mm -hmm. And what about the, their, are they interacting? Mm, no, I don't, I don't think they're, they're talking to each other. And so what do you think their relationship is? Are, are they friends? Are they sisters? Are they, what are they? I would assume that they would be, they would be sisters. And why so? Um, do you have any siblings? No, I'm an only child. Ah, maybe that's why you observe that yeah, so well. Yeah. So, so tell me, maybe you might know better than people who actually have siblings, because maybe it's so more obvious to you, but when, how do people behave when they're around, their, when they're around strangers versus around their siblings? Wait, say that again. I'm sorry. How, how do people behave differently around strangers than perhaps around family members? Uh, they might act a little more annoyed around their brothers or sisters. They might find them more annoying. They'd be more. Blunt. Right, and so and so, would this fall into the category of, of that right there? With their, probably. Yeah, in They're a way. Probably annoyed at each other at a dinner table. Right. So I think you nailed. It. I think the more you kind of now that you've said it, I think probably everyone would probably mostly agree that yeah, that's that's probably what's going on. You got two sisters who are acting just like sisters would, which is, I've known you my whole life. I don't need to put on anything special for you. You know, I, I, they're probably, my get, this is a little more speculation. I think they're having a tea party. These two sisters are sort of doing a little tea party together. And maybe it's something they've done for many years. 
maybe not, but it's certainly something that they've done enough where they've kind of, it's not fresh or new, right? It's, it's nothing like they're definitely dressed up, but it's not like they've got guests coming over. It's a tea party for two and they know each other very well, so much so that they're not really even acknowledging other the sisters kind of checking out the tea to make sure she made it right. But she's just kind of checking out the tea and sort of aimless. So I think there's enough sort of like question marks here for me to ask now, uh, AJ, what is this painting all about? Uh, right? right, that's honestly, sort of that's, that's sort of exactly the point. Like in a way, the painting is almost like defiantly not something you might just like. Even this painting, the one we saw before, is almost more of a, a something you expect to see in a painting because they're sort of posed. Right here, it's very well, like one, like we're not like they don't know we're in the room. We're sort of candidly sneak peeking in onto a world that we're not necessarily entitled to see. Right. Well, the other one shows a uh, like a relationship between a mother and a daughter. And here it's more like the estrangement between two sisters. Right. Right. So no, and, and, if you, and you notice land. that even what about that thing in the background? What's that thing in the background, Mark? I'm sorry. It's, AJ. it's a room divider. Yeah. So in a way, you've got this thing that divides a room. That's 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 kind of the most visible thing. So in a way, the backdrop is division. Right. And what else is that that thing doing? Uh, what's it up against? Isn't it close to the wall blocking a painting? It's, I think it's blocking not a painting, but... Is that a window? Uh, option three? Uh, I don't know. Okay, I, we're gonna pass, no you're, doing a great, you're doing a great job. We're gonna pass just to get more people. Uh, Jocelyn, what's that in the background? Good job, AJ. What's that in the background, Jocelyn? Um, it looks like, like the, the things used to divide a room. Uh, behind that? Uh, is like a doorway? Mm, not a doorway. That's a, a big mirror? Do That's a big door <laughs> or like an entryway. No, it's a mirror, right? Well, how do we know it's a mirror? Well, the same kind of surface that we know, we saw in other paintings of mirrors, we know mirrors from our lived experience. And it's got the sort of border. If, if, if there's any doubt that that's a mirror, any doubt, does anyone dispute that no way that's a mirror? I think it's pretty That can be a, a painting. Mirror. It that could be a painting. It could be a painting. Um, the, po bigger, the bigger point is, even if it is a painting, I think it's the same, it serves the same purpose, which is- There is no purpose. We don't, right, we don't see it, right? If, if it's a mirror or if it's a painting, what matters is that it's covered up, right? It's weird, like we wanna see what it is, but we're not, we're denied it, right? We're, it's, it's, that thing that divides the room also covers up the mirror, right? And so, without getting into too much detail in this painting, I would also just point out one final little thing, those two lemons in the front, right? Those two lemons could very well be the, like basically represent these two sisters. Sort of there's a sort of sour relationship. Lemons are also referred to as had a car as a lemon. Like these two women, if you think a car that's called a lemon is a car that doesn't run very well, right? And I'm not really saying that he's making that point because cars weren't even invented at this point, but probably the word lemon was used in a derogatory way once because it's sour, it's not like a fruit. And I think in a way, it's sort of making visual reference to the fact that these women are all dressed up, they look great, and they've got no one, nowhere to go, no one to hang out with. They're miserable. I like two lemons, like as worthless as two lemons in a bowl. Is there much you can do with two lemons? Yeah, you can add it to other things, right? But so I think this painting is a very subtle look at maybe the life of luxury, the life of leisure, isn't all it's necessarily cracked up to be. Like having tea, it's like basically you develop a tolerance for whatever level of, of lifestyle you have and that becomes normal. And in a way you could say, this is a painting about how normal sucks. <laughs> so I think, uh, uh, Callie, can you see what I'm saying? The point I'm getting at about how the artist is more sort of looking at these two women is not, it's not a flattering picture. It's rather a painting about sort of the banality of, of trying to extract joy from life and and doing so with sort of just through materialism doesn't really do it yeah you, you follow that point you can kind of see it's like she looks so wonderful this dress and yet they're inside you know there's yeah there's a, there's a light coming in it looks like a i can even tell you what i could tell you what time of the year it is in boston almost it's not winter right it's no. like spring it's summer and you know I'm, there's a lot of speculation here but i think you know the artist wants you to sort of uh, kind of 
confront the mystery here, confront a little bit of the alienation going on. So yeah. that's an interesting segue to where we're going, which is sort of, there's something about the modern era, the comforts, the creature comforts that sort of alienate us from each other or alienate us from the traditions that we had in the past. And one thing that gets alienated more than anything is sort of painting from sort of photography. And you think, and we're gonna end on this note, and that's basically what photography presents or the challenge it presents to painting is what do you do in an age of photography? So a, a painter or an artist has a, has a choice between, well, I could, I, why not become a photographer? A lot of people prefer photography for capturing an image. So what do painters do in response to the, 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 the benefits presented by photography? Well, they basically decide, let me do what only painting can do well and leave photography to do what photography does. And we'll do things with painting that you can only do with painting, such as impressionism, which is basically something you would never do with photography, because, but it's very subjective. This is almost like the epitome of subjectivity, the very essence of being subjective. You could say expressionistic, to capture the impression of a place which you can do through painting. And uh, is it clear the point I'm making, Ryan Plensis, uh, about painters doing things now that only that you can only do with painting because otherwise why not just use photography to photograph this scene right the point here isn't yeah. to capture this painting to this picture like an objective picture but it's very subjective it's 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 unapologetically subjective the artist wants yeah. you to sort great okay, okay so yeah because painting really can't compete with photography it takes a lot a lot of time it's not objective as we learn so why even bother trying to capture the world objectively with painting when you can do a much better job being unapologetically subjective right and you guys have learned enough in this class where you could start looking at color here and their complementary colors the sun and the sky the artist is playing with atmospheric perspective even the texture the the, the lack of of details in the in the upper back gives pushes it away the atmospheric perspective Whereas even those little crisp details on the surface of the water seem to sort of put it into focus, like focus it. And so there's subtle little things that provide depth and provide a lot more than you might expect with so little. And one of the other things that happens during this era with photography on the horizon is abstraction. Abstraction is sort of like impressionism, but without any reference to the real world. And that again is something we might have a hard time sort of understanding but even abstraction is something a lot of people have a hard time following or understanding. But remember, it comes in response to photography as a sort of new medium for depicting the world. And here you can see the impressionism of the scene told through the brush strokes that captures the energy of people out having fun, dressed up, and that sort of energy of the city and the modern life is captured in the brush stroke, something you wouldn't necessarily capture with, with a camera that sort of vitality of this moment and here is a great example and we're going to end on this painting today um pardon me <coughs> so the painting is a very important painting you might have seen in the movie ferris bueller's day off have you seen that movie ryan Plentis? No, i've never seen that okay everyone hang up and go see watch ferris bueller's day off just kidding don't hang up but you should Fine, absolutely never... watch ferris bueller's day off it's one of the best movies i think and there's a scene where cameron one of the characters is in the museum and he's looking at this young girl in the middle in white and sort of has this really mo powerful moment between this painting and the main character, secondary character in the movie. So Ryan, Plensis, you're gonna go home and watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, but for now, let's talk about this painting. Is this painting, um, does this painting capture, is this painting an example of naturalism, Ryan? No, not at all. Right, everyone, I hope that's really clear. We've learned about naturalism in this semester. It's very important to remember Naturalism is capturing the world it, the way it looks, but instead here the artist is capturing the world the way it sort of appears, the way the impression of the world, which you could say is told through the energy of these little pointless dots. You might uh, notice, Ryan, can you see at least that this is a painting? Yeah. And it's done, if you look at the details, it's done with this thing called pointillism, which is probably the equivalent, you could say, of pixels, tiny little dots that our eyes blend into swaths of color. So the artist is actually taking little dots and taking the cool colors and like in the woman's dress, violets and purples, 
and they are shadowy and the bright colors and he's letting our eye blend those colors I think so that we can kind of feel the impression of light and how it hits objects and the sort of I don't know what you want to call it the lazy hazy days of summer but the bigger question here Ryan is is this a positive like a happy painting or is there is this a sad painting positive painting because of the the light and everyone's outside and playing and yeah. okay someone time. someone give me a case now for maybe it's not a happy painting it's half and half okay what makes it not happy half the painting is depicted as dark half of the painting is depicted as light okay so you could say the sort of shadow and the light i mean you could just say that's just contrast it doesn't necessarily have any implied darkness as well, their far heads as are down Okay, there you go. Can you maybe you could say some of the people, perhaps their heads are down versus people's heads are up? Absolutely. What else could be going on here that might, um, that might arguably be not like what we would call happy or, well, especially compared to this one here. That's kind of a hint. This one I would it's say like social is- Social distancing. Ah, this is like pandemic distancing, right? In a way, <laughs> like it's almost like you know, someone were violating it, but this one feels oddly, Everyone's isolated, whereas this one doesn't quite feel that way. So what do you think it is? Why, why is that? Uh, what's that isolation all about? And I would argue that sort of one of the clues here is this little girl in the middle who's sort of looking on at this world the way a little kid might, like, like partly in awe, partly with wonder, partly with like maybe terrified, like, look at this whole world that I'm going to grow up into. Um, so how is she, what is this world that she sees? Remember, this little girl in the picture, and you could see her in the middle, Ryan. Ryan Plensis, can you see her in the middle? Yeah. So she's, she's probably like six, we'll say six, and the year is 1884. So this girl will grow up to be, when she's 60, it'll be like 1940, right? And that's roughly when our grandparents were born. So this is your great-grandmother, right? And she's looking at this new world, and what would you say is characteristic about this new world that she's entered, uh, Ryan? How would she, what is she seeing? How would she, how would she characterize the people in this world? Um, it seems like lots of people are do, minding their own business and doing their own things and not really participating in activities together and being social. And what do you think restricts their activities here? Oof. Um, maybe common interests or something like that. So one thing we're going to talk about uh, next class, and I'll just tease you with a little bit right now, is the importance of clothing, right? Think about clothing as something you, if, how long it would take to, to hand sew uh, a shirt for your daughter, right? Like, like uh, here, right? How long it would take to, to sew a dress? And what do, we, what do we do to make, if you want to dress now, Ryan, how do people, <laughs> one would want to dress. How would one get, how would one make a dress, Ryan? in a factory right and these people here are the first generation ever on earth to have clothing made in factories so how does that change the way society is well i mean think about clothing as an outward sign of status and how suddenly everyone can kind of appear high status because they have the same accessibility or the same access to clothing that is sort of standardized is that clothing comfortable, Ryan? Um, I don't know. You're going to have to ask the person that. Okay. Well, let's ask you. Excuse me, ma'am. Is that dress you're wearing very comfortable? No, it took me an hour to get in this dress. I don't know why they're speaking with British accent. They're French. But that dress looks horribly uncomfortable. Uh, let's ask a lady who might be more familiar with dresses, someone in the class. Uh, uh, Callie. Can you give us a little insight into what it might feel like to wear a dress like that or to put it in? Have you ever worn a dress like that? Any of them? Um, I can't say I've ever worn a dress like that, but I know that they must be really uncomfortable. It looks like they've given themselves some sort of fake um, um, buttock kind of thing yep. to accentuate that. Some people do that, I've heard today, but this is even more so. Um, the outfits, what about her, the woman on the right? Let's focus on her. How, what about the upper body outfit she has on, the shirt? How does that look like it feels, Kelly? Um, well, it looks like she must be wearing some sort of like corset under it to get it like that. And then it's very tight fitting. So I really don't think it's that comfortable. Right, and I, I think you can even see the way that she's so stiff. Yeah. And, 
everyone is, feels kind of very stiff, except the guy with a muscle shirt, maybe they're on the lower left, or even a little girl. But especially the animals, like the dog, he's doing things dogs do. There's a little dog there, like they're running yeah. around. Um, the people, however, except for the little kids and maybe the trumpet player, but everyone sort of seems a little stiff. They're hiding under their umbrellas, but the umbrellas don't really cover their whole body. It just covers their face, and the face is the only part of the body we see. And they're all very, like, one color and isolated. It just feels very, like, I think you could say, well, it's a very happy-feeling painting, and yet there's something oddly sort of disconnected about them from each other. Um, do you see that at least, or you could see at least the, the one or the other, Callie? Yeah. And what do you think? How, what's your take on it? Is this, is, uh, is this something that sort of, is it both? Is it neither? Is it one or the other for you? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah, you can see the, certainly I think it's pretty obvious the importance of clothing here. Like, I think you yeah. could say this painting is as much about people as it is about clothing. And did we watch the video of, did we watch the video from New York? in the early 1900s. I don't think we did. Um, so, so next week, uh, or ne on Friday, we'll pick up from here, looking at people, the, some of the first video from the late 1800s, early 1900s, showing people going out wearing really nice clothing as a way to sort of show off this clothing. Um, so we'll see that a little more clearly in the video. And I would just again remind you that when people have clothing for the first time, it's a, another one of these big game changers because you're not wearing sort of the status anymore. You're not wearing tattered rags and you're really sort of, you're blurring. This is a, one of those blurring I was talking about we're gonna see, the blurring of, the, of, of classes visually, at least outwardly blurring. And, and I think we still have that today where, you know, someone can go around Hyde Park with a Lamborghini and it might be leased, I don't know, they could own it, but anyone can kind of appear rich and so that does have a change on the way sort of classes interact and we'll see more of that on Friday. Uh, any question about anything guys? I'm getting in touch with all of you about your your outlines. I've spoken to a few of you and I'll keep uh, chipping away at the, at, the, at, the, at the numbers here. There's quite a few of you but I'll get to you by the end of the week each one of you and then you can start on your rough draft. Any questions anyone? No, no question. All right, have a great day, everybody. I'll see you on Friday. Uh, wait, can I talk to you? <laughs> yes, 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 AJ. Uh, anyone yes. else can hang up if you want. Thank you, bye. Bye, thank you. Let me uh, stop recording here.